you mind? Do, do, do you mind? Uh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Mind giving me a limit? I can. I can hear you. Yeah. You hear me? Hold on. Ah, okay. That now it's working over here. Yes. Yeah. Can yeah, you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you coming through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are. That's off now. So, Perfect. And, so you and, coming oh, through the headphones here? Okay. Yes. So your headphones woo, are in. Woo, we did it. <laughs> yes, it's good work, my man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, where, where are you guys now? Are you guys in the states? No, no. I'm in London, and Craig's in yeah. uh, Aussie. I'm in Aussie land. Ah. Oh wow, the times must be hectic for for somebody. <laughs> Somebody's getting screwed, yeah. No, no, no. Usually one yeah. of us gets screwed, but today both of us are okay, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, like, it's twenty past five here now, and it's I don't know what is it for you, Gareth? Um, yeah. It's, six, no, it's only eight seven. eight thirty, so it's nice time. Perfect. Yeah. I feel old, bro. You guys make me feel no. old. You're kind of like, <laughs> no, yes. But well. seriously, don't just like don't don't worry, don't stress yeah. out because it's just yeah. good to just. Yeah. Be in the flow, you know, for the yeah. chat. Okay, bro. Surely you must say that at least fifty times a day, but eh? <laughs> me. Actually, actually, you actually you know that, that 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 word is not being used as much anymore. I, I, I don't know what happened to it. Kif and okay, I guess maybe in in Joburg, yeah. Yeah. Joburg, yeah. Like, Kif and my, my China. Yes, my China, but that's my middle name, China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah so my my China and Kif is. If you're in the uh, uh, Joburg, not not the south, uh, what what do you call it? the Libs in the east yeah. of Joburg? Oh, the Libs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the Libs. Say China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my China. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, those looks are rough, bro. Those looks are, yes. those are but, probably rough. Even us Oaks in four ways and cents, and we say China still. Don't worry, man. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you're rough. <laughs> no, but but what is also interesting? What that I loved, I loved that. You remember when I moved to Johannesburg? Um, when I really discovered South Africa, when I moved to Joburg, I the first time I heard black people say like my, my China, you know. <laughs> and true. Seriously, in, in Cape Town, it's all of like ish and um, yeah. yeah that, that was that was really cool. And that was when I heard white boys as well go ish. So uh, really? Yeah, it's true actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you won't find that. You won't get that in Cape Town. That's cool, but well, just because. Guys are demanding, eh? Sorry, yes. man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Oh, but it's going to be seen by thousands of people. Flight, we want flight to mode. It. Flight mode. Flight mode. Okay, is that it? And 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 okay, so so it's uh, it's by kiss. Is that right? Just so we got it right. Yeah, or, like okay. by and kiss. Okay, Kif. Bye, okay. No, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, man. Abachis. Abachis. Oh, Bachis. That's even better. <laughs> is, is that what it is? Or is that... Bachis, Bachis is if you're in, in Cape Town, I'm a Bachis. If okay. I go to, to Santon, I'm a boy kiss. Like, ah. you know, Bachis. Bachis. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, Bachis. Waking at dawn. Alrighty, we're here with Bernard Bikes. Uh, welcome to the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. How's it, Craig? How's it, Gareth? Yeah, <laughs> How's it, buddy? it's my pleasure, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so much about you guys. Honored to be on your show. Thank you so much. Likewise, we we have the legend of a director and previous guest, uh, Donovan Marsh, to thanks for uh, introducing us. Yeah, yeah, Donovan's a great guy. He phoned me. And uh, I think I, we actually became quite good friends. And uh, after listening to uh, your podcast with him, I was amazed oh, cool. at all the stuff he actually did. I, I didn't know if you guys really <laughs> uncovered a lot of the, the stuff that he actually did. I was even more impressed with him. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's a, he's Super a guy. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. So, Bernie, your story is, is quite incredible. And um, as with all of us, your childhood and environment affects the rest of your life. And... Uh, uh, yours was not that uncommon for the the area that you actually lived in. So, yeah. so maybe you can take us back to the streets of Hanover Park as a youngster and uh, the way you kind of remember it. You know, um, I think my my my, my furthest back as as I can remember, um, we all know that Hanover Park is is ridden with crime and, and and drugs and stuff, you know. But for me, it was home. You know, you almost you you. This is the situation becomes normalized when you're there. So for for me to walk around and uh, see people on the street, like a, a guy that was drunk from last night, still sleeping on the street or something like that. It's, it's pretty normal, you know? It's only when you leave Hanover Park, when you realize how abnormal we were and how abnormal we are in, that, uh, in the system there. So my memories of, of Hanover Park is, is really, un unfortunately, it's only about gang fights over the weekend 
a lot of church. Oh, because my dad was a, he's a pastor and I grew up in church. So it was a lot of church, uh, literally seven days a week, a Monday, seven days a week and twice on a, on a Sunday. So a lot of church and a lot of, of uh, like, because my, my brother was a, a bit of a gangster before he was, he was openly a gangster. You know, I was a little undercover. So he was openly a gangster. And then what happened was, uh, what I do remember is go, going to school always it took me about 30 minutes, a walk that would be for you, for anybody, probably seven or eight minutes. Took me just over 30 minutes to get to school because I couldn't walk like that. I had to go all the way into Lansdowne Road, walk all the way up Lansdowne Road because you had to dodge the wildcats, dodge the Americans. These are gangs. So, you know, then I would have to walk all the way down Vanguard Drive just to get to, to Crystal, to the school. So, yes. uh, and again, that becomes, it becomes the norm, you know? Um, yeah, so it, it's good. I, I, I say it, all these bad things, I mentioned all these bad things about Hanover Park, but it's also, there's a sense of community there, which I've never found, which I still don't find in the suburbs in Santon, wherever I lived. You know, there's a sense of community. And uh, when I lived in, uh, in Bahrain, in the UAE, I, one thing I really, when I came back to, to South Africa, I embraced the fact that here we don't have the problems that they have in Europe and over there where Muslims hate Christians. And if you go to Hanover Park, it's unbelievable the respect the Muslims have for the Christians and vice versa, you know? Mm -hmm. So everybody just lives together. They'll be like, because you know, the Muslims don't drink. Um, they smoke a lot of buttons though. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, so the Christians would respect, they would say like, you know, you can't go drink there because those are Muslims. Like, just, they just have this respect. So there's that sense yeah. of community. And, uh, you know, when they're fasting, when they're doing their, like now their Ramadan, they would come to the Christian's house, they bring barakat. So mm -hmm. at, when they break their fast at the end of the night, they wouldn't just go to the mood, they'd go to, to Christian families as well. So in that, we have a, there's a very strong sense of community in in the in those in those townships and stuff and um mm. so as much as i took uh bad things that happened to us over there and it's uh, you know they the one thing i can say is that the people are they stand up for each other you know it's almost like if you're all if you, if there's the foot on all of you if you all press down together you know so you'll have to push up together kind of thing yeah. so that's yeah. how we are there yeah yeah that's um, that's super cool man i, I actually um, I've been like into the sort of middle of Soweto a couple of times. Um, yeah. and it's, it's the same thing there, the same story that you said, you know, like there's yeah. obviously all the, the bad things that happen, but yeah. there is that sense of community, like literally have got each other's back, which is super yeah. powerful. And, um, you mentioned church and, you know, your dad being a yeah. pastor, he was like highly respected, highly, um, highly respected. Yeah. And, but you were yourself an atheist. So yeah. How did that kind of go down? You know, you know I, I, I do believe that we're all born atheists because you can't born uh, loving or bowing down to a deity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're all born atheists and, and we get sort of pushed into the direction of whatever our parents tell us to obey, right? So like if I was born in, in Saudi Arabia, what is the likelihood of me being Muslim? I'd be Muslim. If I was born in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. I'd probably be a Jew. So... I was in the beginning stages of my life, I was forced into this, but I didn't feel like I was forced, you know? Um, mm. But my, I, I always had this yearning to want to know more. I think my philosophy and probably in life is like, uh, don't, I, I ask questions, I question everything, you know? So growing up, I wanted to question things. Why, 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 why? And then I can say officially, I lost my religion uh, about 20 years ago. You know, it, it didn't, it could not have happened in Hanover Park. Mm -hmm. I would, I, I would, I would bet a lot of money that there's very the, the amount of atheists in Hanover Park is few and far between, because <laughs> religion is part of your culture, and it's almost like I, I you know, I, I can't even tell anybody in Hanover Park that I'm an atheist because for them, translated atheist means devil worshipper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Six six exactly. six. You, yeah. which, and you just try to explain to them, no, it just means I don't believe there's not enough evidence for what you are saying you know um yeah. and 
even my father, I've never really I tried to, I mean, it's more of a respect thing. I was like, you know, they, they really, really, really believe in this. But if you actually go out there and you discover, and I, why I think I became an atheist was because I took the time out when I went, when I lived, like I told you, in the, uh, in the UAE, I spent a lot of time with Sunni Muslims and I spent a lot of time with Shia Muslims. And because I had this yearning all the time to, for new things and to learn and to want to see, I understood the religion and then I realized, oh my God, there's so much, they, they actually have some, there's some, uh, some fact or some good things in, 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 in Islam. I came back to South Africa and then I spent a lot of time and I lived in, in, um, in the bastion of Judaism, which is Santon and Jehovah, you know? <laughs> And I lived there and I, I had a lot of friends that, that were Jewish. And I began to, underst to understand their, uh, their religion as well. And I opened up to it, you know, and uh, I had a lot of good friends there. And then when I moved to Thailand, I actually went up into the mountains and I lived with the monks for two months to understand mm -hmm. Buddhism. So what it did was when I had a great understanding of all these religions, I could then understand that, hold on, but according to each one of them, they write. So clearly, it can't be like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then I just went deep and I realized, hold on, but I'm, um, I, I mean, it's really for me, it's uh, being an atheist, it's not the hatred of religion, it's the encompassing of, 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 of everybody, you know? Yeah. So people really think if you're an atheist, you hate, I don't hate religion. I hate what people do because people really, they, they, there's good people that believe in, in religion. I'm, I've no doubt that there's good people. Mm. But then if somebody can blow themselves up, because they believe that strongly in a religion, then it becomes a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. if, 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 if the crusades can happen because of, then it becomes a problem, you know? So mm. um, to those people, I have an issue. But I can tell you right now that actually being an atheist made me a better person because now when I, I, did, I don't discriminate if you're Muslim, if you're Jewish, if, you, if you're in need, I'm going to help you. It, and, and Christians will deny it. They will definitely deny it if you ask them. Uh, but if there's a Christian person and a Muslim person in need, I will, I'll, again, I'll put money on this. They're going to help the Christian person first. You know, <laughs> it's, I don't do that. Actually, I think when you become, when you lose your religion, you see everybody as there's a needy child, you know, and it's not like, oh, yes. they're Muslim. They, I, I feel the same way about a kid in Mecca that's starving than I do about a kid uh, in, in a Burundi that's starving, you know? So, yeah. Mm. So I'm, exactly. I'm very, it's a, it's a good choice I made. It's a lifestyle choice. I just, unfortunately there's a, we get discriminated against a lot because mm. people don't understand it, but I exactly. just keep, keep watching uh, clips of Christopher Hitchens and he's, uh, yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. But talking of Richard, you know, Richard Dawkins says, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a Muslim child. There's no such thing as a Christian child. It's yes. just a child, you child, know, and yes. I've always kind of, I've always really liked that in a way. It's like, they don't label children, like let them choose for themselves yeah, exactly. um, yeah. as they get older. So you mentioned your dad and um, why did you consider your mom to be a bit of your crutch? My, my, my dad... My dad was, the people made him into this martyr. They made him into this God. So, okay, imagine this. You, in this poor community, everybody earns an average of a thousand rand a month. Um, everybody lives in the very basic, I wouldn't say squalor, but, you know, very, very, very basic. And he comes, he's a charismatic guy. He's, a, he's, he's got this evangelical way about him, you know, he's like, and um, very charismatic. So, um, but he was poor. He grew up in a, a, a very poor in Port Elizabeth and stuff. So he comes to Cape Town and uh, he, finds, he finds Jesus. So he gets Jesus and he goes into Hanover Park and people sort of embrace him because, you know, he, um, they just, he's got this way. He's got this very dogmatic, he's, he, like he can speak and, and people sort of embrace him. And they, so his, his church grows from three people. We had like church in our lounge to like, 10 and then 10 to 15 and 30 wow. and it just goes bigger and bigger. So eventually they, the amount of people was so much that he had to build a church. So obviously they give their, their tithes and offerings, which I also have a problem with. They have to give 10% of their salary every week to the church. So he takes this 
And this time he's still a good dad. You know, he's got his four kids and he's still a good dad. But what happens after I'm just going to jump on like 15 years later, he's got a congregation of more than 3,000 people. Okay. So everybody uh, addresses him as pastor. And uh, eventually I think he decides, well, now my wife must also address me as pastor. You know, do you understand? Mm. He becomes this yeah. larger than life kind of figure. Mm. And if you take him, he, growing up, he grew up very poor. He had no education and stuff. And then you put this person in a position of power like that. There's not many of us that would say that we wouldn't fall into that trap, you know? Mm -hmm. He fell into that trap and he fell very hard into that trap. He didn't care about his kids. I mean, I'll, I'll make an example. This is the one example that I always take through my life. I tell my wife this and she's like, it's weird I can remember this. The one day we were sitting and, and my mom, they got divorced. And uh, he, he, just, to, just to highlight how little he knows about these kids. So we're sitting in the lounge and after church, I come walking in. I was about... 11, 10, 11. So I come walking in and all the, they call them brothers and the sisters, the brothers and the mm -hmm. sisters are sitting in the lounge with him, you know, and they, they walk in and the one sister says, uh, wow, pastor, your son is looking good. And what grade is he in, 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 in school now? Okay. Okay. And he looks at me and he looks at them and he says, uh, I don't know. And he turns to me and he says, yes. what grade are you in now? In the context of it, at the time, I should be like, yeah, my dad doesn't know. But that stuck with me. I mean, like, wow. this guy doesn't even know, you know? But mm -hmm. my mom, on the other hand, now, this, now you'll understand why. My mom was a disciplinarian. She was the one that healed the sword. She used to hit us. She used to come to me, wake us up in the morning, get to school, give, show me your homework. I want to see this, you know? I was academically, I was actually quite sharp. But of course, when she left, everything went down. So I should, of course, I hated her growing up, which is, you know, they are normally the parents that you, you know, yeah. there's value in that. So when she left, everything went for shit. Everything went for shit. My sister left the house. She got married to a guy that was Muslim. And, you know, of course, how hard that is. My brother yes, went to jail. Dead. My, my brother went to, it was just, it was absolute chaos, but it's only because one thing and one thing only, there was no guidance at home. He was, there was no, you mm. know, he wasn't a parent, but do I blame him? I, I don't blame him, you know, because it, it's a trap he fell into, but he's a terrible, as a parent, he's terrible. I, I can mm. say that with conviction, you know, he, uh, he knows he's, yeah. And my mother, on the other hand, she was, she went into it because she wanted a family. My dad went into this because of the fame, you know, and he was worshipped by the community. So it's hard for him to come home and let my mother tell him, Edwin, you can't mm. do this like, like a husband and wife can be. She was not allowed to speak to him like that. She mm. was not allowed to address him in a certain way. So, and, and that sort of affected us as well. So yeah, mm. he's, a, he's a king. He sits on his throne. Uh, I, when I got back now, I haven't seen him in like 11 years. So I go back, I take my wife to, Han to Hanover Park to see him. So I, we pu I pull up with the car and he pulls up in his car. And you know what he does? He rolls the window down like that. And he's like, hi. <laughs> no ways. I'm like, what? Hi. He's like, yeah, I'm just yeah. going to the bank. Um, no ways. Like, yes, yes. But he, then he tries to like... It, but when there's people around, he tries to justify, I'm a great dad, I'm the best. And, you know, so I really, I got, yeah, he's, he's, as a parent, as a human, I don't know. I mean, he's probably a good person because he has helped a lot of people. He's got mm. big soup kitchens and all of that. As a parent, he sucks. So, mm -hmm. yeah, now that I'm going to be a new parent, I'm looking forward to not being like him. The bar is so low. <laughs> that can, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> classic but yeah so, so yeah I, I, and you're going to be a strict strict parent like your <laughs> you know your mom and uh, <laughs> have some yeah. good rules there <laughs> i think so yeah i probably you, you, the thing is um I, I i got there's good examples in my life and i had good mentors so i want to i want to mix a lot of them i want to even throw a little bit of donovan in there as well because donovan is also just a, a, a new parent now and the way he speaks about his baby is unbelievable his <laughs> face just lights up you know and That's i see cool. that 
And yeah, and so I want to mix, I want to throw, it never works out exactly like you want it to, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, you, you'll try. I want to try. Yeah. For mm. sure, man. Well, but I mean, you, you've, you've, you're such a rounded character. You've, you've experienced so much in your life and yeah. you have yeah, an yeah, nice yeah. open mind and, and these things. Yeah. So you're great dad, I'm sure. So, Fair so maybe enough. you can, maybe you can tell us, you know, you've mentioned, walking to say school and you have to take a huge sort of detour to yeah. skip the gangs and these sort of things, which is, I mean, it's really hard for people like us, I guess, to understand. Yeah. But what yeah. was a, like a typical day like for you in Hanover Park? Uh, at school age. Yeah. Okay, I so, mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, obviously going to school is like anybody else, wherever you go to school, you hate school, school's <laughs> boring, you know, but for us, you know, people always say about like, Oh, your school, it was falling apart and it's derelict and there's the windows are broken. That never bothered us, you know, because you, you went there for different reasons. For us, for me, I kind of enjoyed school. I was a bit of a, ner I, I was rough, but I was a bit of a nerd, an undercover nerd kind of thing, because I remember, mm -hmm. I remember winning, a, oh, this is, oh my God, I can't believe it. I, I, I accidentally won a poetry competition. <laughs> and I <laughs> And and can you imagine what that did to my street cred? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, ah. devastating. Yeah. So so I was, uh, you know, academically I was there. I've got I got like an A for for history again. Accidentally, I was supposed to write something, and then, and uh, so I kind of enjoyed school, but you can't enjoy school too much if you grow up like that because, you know, you got to play rugby. Oh yes, and also I was on the chess team. <laughs> so, but I, I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I was really good at it. Um, so I had to juggle being that dude and mm. also, you know, so and obviously you're going to get picked on if you're in the chess team. But because, <laughs> because my brother was real rough at that time as well, nobody could really pick on me. I was, a, I was timid. I was really, I was a late bloomer. So uh, my brother was really a rough. He was like a, you know, he's a, so, and he was a gangster at that time already. So he used to sort out the guys for me. Um, school for me, I, I must admit, school was enjoyable until I found, okay, and we started smoking buttons. That's when right. things went a little bit south because um, you start smoking at the age of 11, 12. Yes. And you just, you, it's like if you guys, if you smoke now, you, it's, you get a little buzz and you, know, you could still go on with your life. But at that age, you, sh you fuck, yes. bro. Yeah, yeah you yeah. have one joint and you're all laying on the floor and you're just eating and it's, yeah. So school kind of stopped. I stayed out of school once for three and a half months and nobody wow. knew. <laughs> yes, nobody yeah. knew. Every day we used to go, I walked, like I told you, I walked a long way around. And instead of going to school, I just went over to the court where they, by us there's blocks of flats and went over there. And we used to smoke every single day, yes. every single day, smoke. So because there's no, there was no guidance, nobody checked up on me. My mom was gone already. So I, you know, so it was okay. I stayed there for three and a half months and my school, I just neglected the school. And mm. it's not like there was no recourse for it as well, because it's not like the teachers would send a letter to your parents, you know, like, like I think happens nowadays. Um, <laughs> they would just be like, Oh, I thought you left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Wow. So you're back again, like that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. So um, I kind of, I really, I enjoyed, uh, I have to admit, I enjoyed school. But it became a little bit rough. I was stabbed once in school. Um, yes. And it became, the more my brother was, was doing on the outside, the more he was start stabbing people. And, and also in the school, you had Americans. And where our school was, was the enemy, like in that area. So it was getting a little bit dangerous for me to, to go to school and that's yes. where where i decided no i'm not i'm that i'm i'm done you know and um my dad then sent me to another i got expelled actually and then my dad sent me to another school uh alexander sinton which was as you can hear from the name alexander sinton it was like a <laughs> fancy ish school for the yeah. but it was it was out of hanover park so it was more fancy than so i could take the taxi so every morning I take the taxi, but then when I got there, um, I was like the only boy from Hanover Park, and all these boys were like Indians, and 
in Athlone and their, their dad's own shops. And I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I became like the local uh, bodyguard, like, you know. I, re- I remember the one guy, his dad owns a big supermarket called Elite. His surname's Bandiga. And uh, he, he was being bullied. And so when I got there, he told me in the, in the bathroom, like, listen, I'm being, I was like, okay, who are these guys? You just tell them I'm your guy now, but every week you bring me this and that. I don't, I can't remember what it was. So I, used get, I used to get money from these guys every week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, because they were also scared, you know, and the stuff that I could do there was basic stuff I did back in Hanover Park. <laughs> they, we wanted to do bunk. They all wanted to do bunk, but nobody could leave the school because they locked the gates. And then I said, who, oh, whose dad owns a, a hardware? So the one guy's dad, he said, okay, bring me a bolt cutter. <laughs> so I cut a, a hole in the gate that you could open and close, like, you know. <laughs> and this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, I was the hero. For them, that was a massive thing. So, yeah, my school life, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I got expelled from that as well. So, um, yes. yeah, I, 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 I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my, my school life. I must say, if, if anything, if I can look back and uh, say that, I, I wish my, if my mom was there, she would have pushed me. And I probably would have had uh, some kind of, I don't know, degree or something, you know. But done yeah. differently, yeah. So, yeah. so what standard did you get to in the end? What grade? Uh... Well, you can't get a seven, right? Because so you get your junior certificate is an eight and or you can right. get matric. So if I only pass seven, I only get a six. So I, I, right. people ask me, did you pass matric? I say, yeah, I pass matric every day on my way to stand at seven. So <laughs> <laughs> the only way I pass matric. So, so yes. yeah, so I've got so, I passed seven. Yeah. No, so at 16, you, you um, actually started... Um, making zip guns uh, for some of the gangs. And yeah. this was a yeah. kind of your first proper taste of some of these bigger yeah. gangs, and, but yeah. also sort of an early sign of some of your entrepreneurialism. So I guess, yeah. Uh, what happened? You know, uh, I heard about this. There was the guys on the other side of Hanover Park called the Laughing Boys. No, they are, they are not, it's not funny. They are serious. They were, <laughs> they had a gun. Now, of, of course, that time it wasn't so... Uh, there was not guns were not so prominent, you know. And then I heard about this gun that they made called a zip gun. Somebody made it and somebody brought it there. So they brought it to us once. We were uh, MSK massacres on the part of the mongrels. So they brought the gun and I looked at it. We only had it for like a day, and I looked at it and I thought, wait, I could make this, you know. Hmm. And of course, my my dad, my dad had two guns, and my dad had bullets and everything, you know. So I was like, hold on. Because you, you need to sort of reverse engineer it starting from the bullet. Because, you know, it's like if you, if you have a 38, that zip gun will only fit that 38, you know, and you yeah. need to get the pipe that's going to, any case. Um, so I looked at it, looked at it, looked at it. I thought, this is easy enough to do. And I didn't say anything to, to Stanley and to these guys. I said, okay, I just went. And I, start, I worked on it and I got the right wood and everything. And I made it. I made the first one and I gave it to them. And these guys were like, what? So uh, we had a problem with bullets, I remember. Bullets was the thing. And I had to steal bullets from my dad, hmm. which obviously got right. But the thing is, the, the, the problem with that is so I got some dude shot in his arm as well. Because you need to, uh, the barrel needs to be 100% straight. Okay. And because the, the bullet spirals out there, there can't be anything in the barrel. Mm. So a lot of the times the bullet would go out of the barrel and just turn left. Like, it was, or, you know, it would just do that. Sometimes <laughs> while they were fighting, they would, we would shoot. Because you, you pull the back with like an elastic, you know, and then you have a, long, a nail, like a six inch nail that just hits the bullet right at the, at the pin. And then uh, a lot of times we would actually shoot the guy right next to us, like one of our friends. So that happened. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, wow. So yeah, I'm, wow. I made a few of those. Um, I tried, I tried. Eventually, I think I, I got it like right. But then I, I thought it was getting out of hand because you, it's never enough for these guys, you know. And I'm the young, uh, young. It's like okay, another one, another one. Oh, this one blew up. So I was like, hold on. And then there was a little bit of pressure on me. So I'm like, whoa. So yeah, I, I kind of put that pressure on myself. And then um, actually, I remember as, as a year or two later, they brought me a shotgun a sawn off shotgun and they said now it wasn't can you fix this it was more like yeah fix this <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah 
I actually got I fixed that as well. So I, yeah, I think I just my dad taught me a lot of technical stuff working on the cars. It's 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 very basic things, you know. But yeah, that was my thing. I used to make guns for the for the guys, and that also it was my my card, my get out of jail card. So which meant that I could walk in our area any time of the night. Nobody would touch me. Why would they want to touch the guy that that's you know making the guns mm. and stuff? Wow. So that's crazy, yeah. man. And and yeah. what, why is gangsterism so rife? Like bes- besides the obvious, because people are not yeah. earning a lot of money and stuff. Is there any yeah. other reason? Um, okay, well, let's t- we, we we drugs, right? So we we can say that that's of course. I I I would say every conversation or everything that we can mention about gangsterism, there will be a line, and the one thread through all of them would be drugs. Mm-hmm. So that that's that's what um, I think gangsterism is the main drive. But then you get all the societal things like oh we're all thrown in together mm-hmm. into one um, we're all thrown into this one big pot and we can just and everybody's living on top of each other and uh, drugs and uh, this. I, I I think. You know, it's a number of reasons, but I think it's 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 become such a part of our culture. Hmm. So 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 what happens is like the the kids now, eleven, twelve, thirteen, it's actually cool for them to be a gangster. You know hmm. what I mean? It's like it's it's a cool thing. The fact that you could lose your life doesn't it doesn't matter. Hmm. It's cool to be a gangster. It's only because I believe that they don't know other. If you give somebody more options, you know, what's the guy, uh, what's that um, professor of psychology in Vancouver that did the rat, the, the they oh, gave, yes. yeah, well, they gave rats. The depression the, story, yeah. Yeah, so, so people, don't, people don't use drugs because of the drug is addictive. They use drugs because mm. of what's happening around them. Because when, when they gave the rats the mm-hmm. same drugs, but it made them a more of a playground, a rat park, he called it. Rat park, yeah, that's yes. it, yeah. So the rats r- ran around in the park instead of taking the drugs. Yes. So, so my God, I'm comparing us to rats here. Sorry, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, I think there should be more activities in, in, in those areas. You know, it sounds simple, but I think that will really help. If we have more activities, if it's cool to be different, you know, like, Guys can't be different. You know how hard it is, guys, to be different in those areas. It's tough, bro. It's mm-hmm. tough if you don't wear what everybody else is wearing, you know? Mm-hmm. If you don't, and, and if you're living in a block where there's 120 houses, they have these two blocks next to each other. So what, four people per family. And it's, it's tough if you want to be different. Now, if you go mm-hmm. to Santon or Rondebosch in Cape Town or, you know, Camps Bay or whatever, it's okay if you're different. You know, mm-hmm. you want to you want to do theater. Some other guy wants to play netball or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But try that shit in Hanover Park. Try, no, mm-hmm. there's something wrong with you. You're a morphy. You're mm-hmm. a, you know, you get you get. And at that age, it is important for us to have friends. It is so you don't want to be, uh, you know, or yeah, you know, you don't want to be. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't want to be that guy. So I don't know. There's no silver bullet or some fantasy. I I can't say that, that I know how to fix it. But I mm-hmm. do know this, and I do know this for a fact. If we put in more socially, if we put more focus on the teachers and the schools, giving people uh, opportunities like let's go play play basketball activities, those are the kind of things. Because there's nothing to to do, bro. There is absolutely, you go into those areas, we had uh, netball courts and there was nice little parks before. Now they're, they're saying it's too dangerous to play outside. This is what they're saying. Mm-hmm. But it's a vicious damn circle. Somebody's yeah. got to do something. It's just kids are bored. There's no activity, you know? And, um, and, and also now kids got no excuses because that time back then, right? When we grew up, there was nothing. There was no internet, nothing. So I could almost justify us going stabbing each other because that was our own cowboys and crooks. Mm. But now you can, I mean, this, go onto YouTube, mm. you know, go on to do those things. Then now I blame the government and only now because I, I don't know a lot of people are trying to get me into like, do you blame South Africa? Do you blame the government? I hate blaming apartheid. That's, we're so past that already, mm. you know. But if I want to blame them, I can say this. 
put some damn free Wi-Fi in Cape Flats and in Hanover Park and there and those mm -hmm. areas. Let the kids get out of their head. Let them explore the world. Let them go onto YouTube. Let them see what's out there, you know, because they're living in this, in this rut. It's poor. To get mm -hmm. out there, you need to take a taxi. That's going to cost you 20 bucks and then you need to get back and, you know, People, the kids need to geographically Cape Town is so screwed because you know there's no we don't really uh, we don't mix mm. the guys at the back they just they stay there and, yeah. and if they get the opportunity to come to Camps Bay see Camps Bay see wow look at a nice Ferrari hold on I could get that see a colored guy managing a, a, a restaurant small things you know I, I don't even go yeah. big it's, that that gives them the motivation but they don't get the opportunity to leave that place and that's yeah. that's the problem yeah, yeah but um so so we actually spoke to a guy his, a couple of weeks ago on our podcast his name is eric bergman and he he has set up a, a charity like in africa it's in ghana but he's also been to south africa so yeah. and, and his website is called great.com what we'll do after the podcast is we'll actually put you guys in touch because uh, this yeah. is something that he's really kind of wanting to do so it could yeah. be a great connection to help you, uh, oh, you guys connect and stuff um okay. So by just talking like a little bit about, you know, what you just spoke about now, like you're involved in this, but then you also, you had this sort of foresight to uh, not want to be there, you know, and you're like, I want a different life. And, yeah. and, you, did, and you did that. You sort of, you yeah. went to the city, I think you went into yeah. Cape Town and yeah. you got yourself a job and yeah. this was a, a life changing moment and you yeah. met, met a mentor yeah. for there who was also your namesake. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Dallas, bro, Dallas, Dallas <laughs> saved my life. I tell you what, uh, because you know, remember, I don't know, um, you guys are way too young for this. Every Tuesday night at eight o'clock was Dallas. Right? I'm not Dallas, but I didn't watch Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I was always, I, I always, I wanted to aspire to, to, I was a dreamer, not was, I still am. I'm a dreamer. So we have to start there. So you got to, like, again, when I have a kid, I want to allow him or her to dream because this is where it all starts. So I, I dreamt my way out of Hanover Park. So I remember at school, I used to always tell the, um, my friends stories, which was an absolute lie. Like, I would tell them when I was a kid. They told me later on, I used to tell them stories like, oh, my parents, we flew to, to America and we, for the weekend, like, bullshit stories like that, you know? Then I was like, no, it's true, it's true. So... I dreamt my way out of there and I never walked. I, I left Hanover Park with 32 Rand. I, yeah. yeah, but 32 Rand's a lot at that time. Right? <laughs> um, I saved at the post office. So every, you could put two Rand, three Rand, five Rand. I, I would say if I have to say 32 Rand's probably about 3,200 now. Okay. Yeah. So I uh, saved, saved, saved at the post office. And I had about, I remember I was very upset because they keep five Rand. You can't take everything out. Yes. I was like, and then when I got to that, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm going to leave. And I went. Was there. this the building society? And No, no, it's the post office. You can, <laughs> oh, actually, bank, uh. <laughs> yeah, you can actually bank at the post office. And uh, so I went there, had my little book, and they gave me the money. And I went home, and I was like, that's it. I'm out of here. I remember going into my dad, and I said, look, I'm leaving. You know, he just looked over, and he's like, uh, okay. And I was like, yes. no problem. Yeah. Wow. I left. I left black bag. And. Uh, I, I, we call it stealing train. Of course, I had the money, but I wanted to save the money. So I, I, I like stole train, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we get, I went into the city and I was like, uh, what now? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I just knew that my ambition was much stronger than reality and whatever was happening around me, you know, I, was, I needed to get the hell out of there. Because what happened was I sneaked away a few times and came to the city. And I was walking around looking at the buildings and stuff. And I was like, wow. You know, because it's, it's just realistic and it's plausible. It was plausible at the time for me to think that I could also drive a car like this guy. I, you know, mm -hmm. so I, you know, and I don't have to do it by stealing his car. You know, there's ways you can do it. I can do it. But mm -hmm. at that time, of course, there was more whites. There was the only coloreds and blacks that were in the city. They left at five o'clock because, you know, they work there and boom, you're out of there. So I decided, no, stuff that. I'm, even if I have to live in the street, 
I'm going to, I'm going to do something with my life, you know? So, I mean, it, it, it wasn't easy. And eventually I gave up. I was like, ah, fuck it. I have to, I'm going to have to go back now. And I was like, <laughs> oh, how embarrassing, you know, that mm. I have to. So I thought, okay, well, no problem. I remember getting in the train and going back and I met this smug mofo. Oh, he's so smug. <laughs> I knew, I knew their family. They were, they had a little bit of money. They had a they, we all were living in council houses and they had, his dad built them a house. So they were so smug. And I, and he's like, hi. I was like, oh, his name is mm. Randall. And he's sitting there. So I knew what was going to, and I'm sitting with a black bag. So he's like, what are you doing? Uh, I'm like, so this was always me, you know, I, I don't know, you can, you'll call it lying, I'll say stretching. <laughs> uh, so he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, no, no, I just come from work now, you know? He's like, oh, where are you working? I said, no, I'm working in town. And he's like, oh, I said, what are you doing? He said, no, they're opening this new place and uh, there's bar and he's the bar manager. Listen to him. I, I caught him like that. He's the bar manager. So I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, where's the place? And he's like, no, they're hiring so many people. And I'm like, ding. Uh, <laughs> I, re I remember we were in, uh, what's the station? I don't know, Salt River Station or something. And as he said that to me, like lights and bells went on. And I was like, oh, oh shit, I forgot. I, have to, I forgot something. I have to get off here. And I got off, <laughs> jumped over. I got into the next train because I, I solicited out of him all the information about exactly where the place is and stuff, you know. Hustle, brother. Take your chances. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I went back. I said, what can it hurt? One more night in the city. It can't hurt, you know. So I went back and wow, this place was like it was, it was pumping. Everybody was bringing crates and it's like, you know, the final three days before opening. It's busy and, and they had like people interviewing people, the radios and it was a massive place. It was the indoor Grand Prix. It was like under the bridge, under the broken bridge in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. They converted that whole thing to a go-kart racing track. And then on the one side, they had this massive diner. It looked like an old 1960s diner, you know, with the checkered floor and the just beautiful. Cool. And I walked in there and I was like, wow. I was like, what now? Who do I? And then I heard them shouting at this one guy. I just had his name, Bernard, Bernard, Bernard. And I said, I said, clearly this is the main guy. His name's Bernard, you know? So I was like, um, and I thought I waited, waited, and I got my gap and I ran to him and I said, Bernard, um, you know, I'm also Bernard, always, always trying to be cocky. And so, <laughs> so he looks at me and he's like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened, but he said, what can you do? I'm like, um, I, no, he asked me, can you be a barman? I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> let, that lesson, let that be a lesson to you kids. Always say yes. You can always yes. go and learn all that. Like, okay, and you like, make it. <laughs> Exactly. So he's like, uh, okay, where did you work? So I'm thinking, okay, this white boy is not going to know if I say the Galaxy. Because the Galaxy is like the most famous colored club, you know? Oh. Because it's the only place I know. And I go to him and I say, I was a barman at the Galaxy. And oh, fuck. He looks, he says, oh, I know the owner of the Galaxy. Can oh, I give him? I'm like, oh, oh shit. No. <laughs> and he, I'm like, but My I can't. Person. I have to I have to keep it up now, you know? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can call him. Um, obviously, a few months later, he told me he knew I was lying, but <laughs> okay. He Classic. said, right, we'll start you at the bottom and then you'll go to the top. Bro, that was the happiest day of my life. I was wow. like, hallelujah. So it's like, yeah, you're going to be here tomorrow morning at seven. And um, yeah, in any case, it was so busy for him that I think I sort of got in by accident. I sort of came in by the back door because mm. he was so busy. With, he was like, when I got there the next day, he was like, oh, oh you, um, yes, just go fix those boxes. <laughs> and, and I was like, I, man, I didn't even know how much money I was going to earn. <laughs> it was just, I wanted to get into the system, you know. And yeah, I, I, I worked there with, I, it, was, it was amazing for me. Because you know, like bright eye, bushy tailed, I was like, everything was... Because I was very lucky because that was the most famous place in, in, in Cape Town at the time. So you had all these TV guys and radio guys and all the famous people came there. So I was like, wow, I don't need to get paid to do this, you know, just to, uh -huh. um, and I'm trying to hobnob. But somehow I, I had a bit of a charm at that time as well. And people started to like me, you know, and they sort mm -hmm. of went back to him to say, oh, that guy, we really like that guy and stuff like that. So 
So yeah, so that was my very, very, that was my way out of Hanover Park. That, yeah. that was what, what made me say, you, like I said to myself, Bernie, you're right. You know, this is the first rung on that ladder now. And I always knew that. I was like, this is, you, you, you stepped in there, stay away from the brandy. Don't steal brandy. Mm. Don't, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was tough because eventually Bernard was he's such a great guy. He tested me, you know, he, uh, I had access to the money, to the till and all of that, you know. Wow. Uh, I said to myself, if any of the guys in Hanover Park must now know that I, they would be like, okay, cool. Listen, tell us when we'll come. And, you yeah. know, I was like, uh, uh, it's not going to happen you know yeah. so yeah Crazy. he just trusted you he gave you that like just, just that little bit of that thing that that was really you and you didn't you know abuse that trust but oh, you know no. so bernard became quite a like a mentor for you and um, yeah. Yeah. and so like why, why do you why do you say sometimes like we all need a bernard father like why yeah. is a mentor so so important or why was it so important to you it's essential my man because you know if you uh, you know, a mentor is somebody you admire, you want to be like, you love him, all those things, you know. Um, not always is, are your parents your mentors. I mean, I'm an, I'm an example of that. So we have to choose mentors. And for me, there's two types of mentors. You need a, your fantasy mentor. Like, let's say my need would be Nelson Mandela or Christopher Hitchens, for example. Yeah. You know, he's dead. But Nelson yeah. Mandela did. The, the, those are the people, realistically, you know, you uh, I'm probably never going to be the president of South Africa. And I'm probably never going to spend 28 years in jail. And, but that's a, that's a great goal. That's something to look, look at. And you, you want to aspire to be like that. Then you also need your realistic mentors, the people you can reach out to, the people, you know, kind of that, that big brother project that they have in the States where, you know, instead of sending kids to jail, they, you, you can actually get a big brother that looks after you every weekend uh. and stuff, and they mentor. This is what I want to do in South Africa. This is what I want to do in Cape Town as well. It's because I, I mean, I can tell you all these good things about Bernard. I was lucky because he is a good person. He never, he always told me, like, Bernard was the most calmest person ever. You know, people would steal from him. I would catch them, like, in the stealing this. And then he would be, he'd be like, but you know what? they probably need it. So I would be like, what? Let's kill them. Let's. Like, so that stuck with me. And if your mentor tells you that, mm. that's, what you aspire, that's what you want to become, you know? Mm. So I think, and, it, and one day I will get this right. I will do it in Hanover Park. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going back there again. But it's important for those kids. There is no realistic mentors. They all have their aspir their, their sort of fantasy, their, they no, don't have realistic mentors. So what happens when I go back there? You'll see the way the kids look at me. They look at me and they say, they see, I can do what he did. He comes from here. He hasn't, I mean, mm. I don't, I, the way I'm speaking to you right now is not the way I speak when I go there. Because mm. I'm still like, yeah, how is it my bro? And, you know, <laughs> because, so it is important for you to do that so they can understand it's, there's a realistic path to success. And, you know, and mm. that I come there with a little, with my rental car. It's a little Kia or whatever. I'm not coming in there with a Ferrari mm. or anything. Yet they aspire for that. The basic stuff they want to do, they want, they look up to that. So a mentorship program in Hanover Park and the Cape Lads, I think will do a hell of a lot. It starts mm. with the schools though. It starts with the teachers sort of, you know, identifying who the kids are that are going in that, in that direction. And then calling up people like me, calling up people like Sean Brophy. There's a lot of people that lived in that area that has now gone on. I'm not saying super rich, but it's gone on to be independent people that owning yes. their own houses and stuff. And this is what the kids need. They need to know that it's possible because too, too much in today's, uh, in South Africa, there's this uh, sense of entitlement. Apartheid is gone. So look up into the sky and um, a, a million dollars is just going to fall. It doesn't work like that. The fact that apartheid is gone only means that it's now an equal opportunity. You still got to go out there and, you know, take opportunities, make, make your own opportunities. And they don't understand that yet. So t it's going to take people like me to go to them and people like friends of mine that grew up there. That's made a little bit of a success. I go there at least as much as I can. I wish I could 
tell friends of mine, you see, if even taking you guys there, it won't work. You know, get, taking mm -hmm. Gareth and Craig there, they're mm -hmm. going to be like, eh, I know I'm sorry, but that's because he's white. But let's be honest, that's what it was yeah. in our country. They do You've got to find the connection see. and so, the, the common ground. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. And I, I, that's, I, I have a very firm belief and I'm very passionate about that because I, that's what I eventually want to do. Start a big brother program, you know, take these guys out. I promise you will save a lot of guys from being gangsters because they can see like, I want to be like this guy, you know? Mm -hmm. and, so, yeah. Mm. So, so, so what, what, what is like almost holding you back from doing that now, do you think? Well, I mean, I find myself in a, in a very st odd, strange position right now because I, I got back to South Africa. I'm not working. I'm not doing anything. I've opened this charity. Everything's going in there. But now the clock is ticking for me because, you know, your, your money doesn't last forever. I sold a, a little uh, ice cream shop over there. And it's a year that I've been back now. I haven't worked yet. And I'm just so, you know, it's also silly of me to just plow money in and not, you know, when, you know what happens when, when, in, a, in a plane, when the plane goes down, they say, you save yourself first mm. and only then can you save others. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, I mean, the clock's ticking negative for me right now. So yeah, that is holding me back. Once I have some kind of stability where I know, mm -hmm. you know, okay, right. I'm stable. I'm cool. So now I can work. Um, my weekends will be worked around that. That's for sure. I mean, I've, mm. I have a lot of fun. I I'm, I'm, I'm balls to the wall always, you know? Um, but I believe Man, I get so much satisfaction out of what I like of my charity that I've got in Hanover Park. Like the the best thing that ever happened to me was a few months ago when we I did a soup kitchen, and this old old lady, she's standing there. She comes every week, and she 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 walks through the line and she comes to me and she's like, I, I'm gonna translate it. She said, I just want to say thank you. I've been waiting the whole week for this. And I'm like, oh, oh dude, mm. dude, for one bread oh. and a big a bowl of soup. And I'm like, I saw this auntie. I grew up in this area. She was, she, she was in the, bowl, in the uh, court across. So she saw me as a kid. There's a possibility yeah. she probably invited me into her house as a kid and gave me a slice of bread. Mm. Maybe. I don't know. But now she's, you know, I could do that for her. There's no greater satisfaction than that, bro. You can't tell me there's, and I've seen a lot. I've traveled, I've owned a lot of stuff. Mm. I've did a lot of stuff. I've, dri I've driven a Ferrari. It wasn't mine, but you know, <laughs> that did a lot. There's no greater satisfaction than that for me, at least. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah sure, but, wow. so, but there seems to be like a theme in your life where you like, you know, you start from kind of nowhere and then you, you, you grow and you, yeah. you become successful and work your way up. What do you yeah. think that, what are those skills that you have that uh, have allowed you to do that? Uh, yeah, I think it's maybe just knocking your head a lot of times, you know. Uh, look, I could do, I could easily do without starting at the bottom, because <laughs> right, <laughs> right now I'm at the bottom and I'm like, oh, fuck, can I just like start earning already, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it does, it 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 makes you stronger, it makes you better, and it also humbles you. It it does, it has humbled me, um, because I know how to save, because I know what it's like to have nothing. You know, so I know, and I'm I'm fortunate with my wife as well. I mean, she's um, she's from Norway. They were very obviously, you know, the economy is quite successful and stuff. Mm -hmm. And she's used she's used to having everything she needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's not rich, but they're having everything mm -hmm. she needs. And I'm very fortunate to have somebody like her that, like, when we ha when we low, then we low together. You know, I, mm -hmm. I suppose you'll get some other woman like, oh no, I really want that mm -hmm. steak. You know, so. I think it's made me tough. It's made me resilient. And it's made me also understand, um, it made me understand the bottom, like the, the guys, the, not the bottom feeders, that's rude, but the, the oak at the bottom, you know, so always in mm -hmm. business, my, my strongest in, uh, I was always strongest in business because I had the team with me. When I had my restaurants, I could let my staff work. They would work 12 hours for me mm -hmm. without complaining. Because I would sit and have lunch with them, mm. you know. Mm. My staff till today phone me, and mm. there's, there's I've got one in Dubai. He's running a big uh, events company there. Sends me an email thanking me for teaching him, you know. I go yeah, yeah, cool. so so. I think that's where it comes in. Um, all these things starting from the bottom. As also, I'm a bit of a I I, I self destruct sometimes. <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I get too high, I just like I self destruct. I don't know why, but that's what it is. And then I like, then I start at the bottom. And maybe I get more pleasure 
out of starting from the bottom, you know, I, yeah. I, I, uh, there's, I don't know. there's something to be said for that, you know, like Probably. starting something up and building it up and seeing yeah. the change and connecting with the people there. And, yeah. and, and that's clearly, you've got a big heart and you, you care for those people like, and you yeah. still do, you know, like, and, yeah. and, and people feel that and see that from a mile away. And I think that's yeah. yeah, a great, a great trait to have, man. But, um, so, so you've obviously, look, you've done so much by that stage and, um, you really proved yourself at this diner. Um, and uh, ultimately you, um, uh, it moved on to Nando's where you had also yeah. really thrived as Gareth yeah. had mentioned. Um, yeah. but at this stage, your life kind of took a little bit of a left turn and, yeah. uh, and you got involved with the, the Browns club, uh, which yeah. is one of Cape Town's most notorious or well, yeah. with one of the most notorious gangsters yeah. there, Cyril Beaker. Yeah. Um, how did you get involved there? Man, I used to hang out there first in uh in the clubs and being the very silent quiet guy in the corner that i am <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah so <laughs> yeah the introvert that I am, nobody knew me no yeah they kind of got to know me and uh, i got i was approached by his brother to say listen man uh i was I, I sort of i think i just resigned from nando's and he's like why don't you pull in with us and uh we want to buy this club and you're the right guy to take this the club forward and revamp it and whatever. I was like, bring it on. Because I mean, come on. I mean, I don't know how old am I now? Twin, late twenties, maybe. Yeah. In any case, my timeline sucks. So in any case, so in my late twenties, now you can, you can work with like the top guys in the city. You're going to have your own nightclub. Hello. Can I get a witness? This is like, wow, dude, nobody's going to say no. So I'm like, yeah. And this is like the most powerful dudes you're going to operate with. So of course it's a no brainer. And then I started with them. Um, it was fun, man. It was so much fun. Like, uh, like having to redisplay the place again and, 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 and relaunch it. So this is a very strange time because this was just when ecstasy sort of took over remember that time there was like a it's almost like the lights went on and the lights went just <laughs> and like boom so I, I remember the bar was doing i'm going to use like figures just let's say the bar was doing five thousand rand a night mm. we went from doing five thousand rand a night with the same amount of people to doing like a thousand rand a night <laughs> like <laughs> what the f you know and so just we did this like, yeah two th <laughs> exactly and everybody was like Mwah. yeah so <laughs> So the so the the powers that be came to me and said, okay, listen, we know what the pro, what the issue is, right? We're gonna do our own shit now. Hmm. So and then obviously, okay, again, I'm tr I'm gonna try not to you mention too many names because I don't want to incriminate any people. Then you know we we kind of we ran the shit then. So we hmm. got our own we got our own uh, packages of you, you know X Y Z, and then we caused. Um, we were the most powerful consortium in the city. We then took over every single club in the, mm. in, in the city. So mm. basically, you're under our umbrella, you're going to stay out of the rain. You're not under our umbrella, it's going to keep raining on you in fucking town. So you better be careful, you know? So most people, everybody just went with us. And we had, I mean, we weren't, we were different kind type of gangsters then. It wasn't, we weren't standing on the street corner with our pants on, on our knees. We had, were driving M3s and, you know, we had like Uzis in the car and, you know, it was, but it was, it wasn't, you see, this is, this is the thing. I always hear these things about extortion and it, there's a place for it because before we took over the city, every club, let's say, let's say there was just 20 clubs, 20 clubs, every club had their own uh, bounces. So like four bounces, two at the door, two inside. Right. And, they obviously every club because you you can't take a knock like that on your at your bar you're going to start selling your your stuff at the door and you know mm. and so it was always a war there was always the, this club wouldn't allow kids to come in from with drugs if the, if you were high already they wouldn't allow you to come in because you must buy you know so there was always a, mm. a and there was always fights and these bouncers used to fight with the bouncers from the other club so it was you know just mayhem. So what happens is you come in like EPSA, Amalgamated Banks of South Africa, and you amalgamate everybody <laughs> and you say, right, listen, okay, one place will supply all of you. Every club, you give us 15% of your turnover. But <laughs> if you need any support, anything happens, pick up the phone, there's emergency line, 
boom, we have a car there, five minutes, sort your problem out. Makes sense, right? Wow. So the crime went down, I, I think something like 70 to 80% in the city because no bullshit anymore. We were all uniformed. They knew that don't mess with this club because you got like pro security, you know? So yeah, because we had, uh, so that if nobody would mess with the clubs, bouncers didn't, weren't fighting amongst each other. Everybody got their piece of the pie, you know? So that was a fun time. But you know what I didn't realize was I'm just a gangster again, mm. you know? Mm. Different environment, gangster again. It was a hell of a life, bro. I was doing, we were open six nights a week. I was doing ecstasy and coke every single night, okay? Wow. I, that's not a bad thing. Good thing. <laughs> um, then I had to, I, I got home at like four in the morning, get mostly with someone on your arm, which you probably don't know their name or whatever, you know, you yes. gave a free entrance to come into the club. So you know how it goes, maybe. And then, uh, <laughs> then you take tablets to fall asleep again. So it's, it's a vicious, vicious, vicious circle. So your health mm -hmm. takes a knock. You don't know it though. But you just like that's it's just it's party time, you know. Um, yeah, that got to me. That's just like, but I was living I was living a good life until one night we did something really bad. I mean, a lot of people got hurt in in that. Lots of people got hurt. We hurt a lot of people because also at that time, Cyril was uh, taught me a little bit the integral uh, art of, of of taekwondo and fighting. He was a seventh dan, so mm -hmm. you know he kept these guys like always on a, on a high level, always alert, you know. And he taught me a lot about fighting and, and looking after yourself, which again gave me more confidence. You know, you, you guy walks chest out if he's, if he can look after himself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so we hurt a lot of people, not people that didn't need it though. Um, because you know, these breakers, <laughs> you know, the big, big guys who come to the town and start pulling girls and yeah. So, and I, uh, we sent a, a dude, he actually died um, he, and he, they revived him again. So, so that was cool. But I, that night, that fear that I had in me, I, that fear drove me to the next step, next phase in my life because I was like, oh my God, we hit this guy and the first phone call like I got that he's dead, he died in Khrutske. I got another call about an hour later that they revived him. And that fear... When in that hour, when I thought to myself, that's it, my life is over now, because the two people I did it with, they were serious, like they were big guys, you know. So there's no way that they're going to stand for it. Of course, I must, you know, I'm, I'm, and I have to do it, because otherwise yeah. they're going to kill me. And uh, yeah, that's when I decided, no, fuck this, it's not worth it, you know. And uh, yeah, I had to go give them my resignation card. Well, there's no such thing, but yeah, I had to go and I say, listen, guys. That's it. I couldn't tell them it was because of that, though. Hmm. Do you understand? That would not make me look good. Yeah. And the problem was with me leaving at that time was I knew a lot, you know, and would they let me go? This was a, this was the issue um, because the stuff that I did and the stuff that I was involved with and the stuff that I saw, you can't just leave, you know, the brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you must be fearful. Say? Yeah, yeah, bro. I was scared. I was shitting myself. I remember getting that call when uh, they said to me, "Come to the office," just like that. <gasps> and because I already put the word that I'm not coming in, I'm I'm done. Uh, I want to see you in the office. Oh, and it was a Saturday, bro. And I'm thinking there's nobody in the office on a Saturday because the office was in this in the city, uh, on the second floor, and they had the whole. There's the security office, and I'm like, this is it. I'm gonna, and I, I'm done for. Yeah, I'm done. And I get there, and uh, I phone him from the bottom. He says, okay, just ring the buzzer. I'll come to the door. So now I know there's no secretary, nothing. Oh, I'm shit. seriously, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. But you can't, you can't run away now. You know, it's too late. I went in. As I got in, I'm walking, 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 and he's he's alone in the office, and he looks at me. He says, what's wrong, my boy? And I was like, yeah, I want to, you know, it's, I have my health and I'm blaming my health and all of this. I'm like, I can't do it anymore. And I said like, you know, you see, I'm opening the club late and all of this. And he's like, okay, don't let anybody, don't take any calls from anybody. I'm giving you the grip. So I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, 
that's it. Sick. He loved me. He embraced me, this Cyril, you know. He was a great guy. I mean, this was like the roughest, toughest guy ever. But he used to, after the first couple of months, he used to hang out with me, you know. Mm. He used to send all the bouncers out to get out. And then he sits with me, and he's like a serious guy. Then he says, close the door. Then it's just me and him. And then he says, right, have you got any Elvis? <laughs> 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 then he sings some Elvis. Yeah. That so, yeah, he, yeah, he totally embraced me. And, yeah, that's when I got, got out of it. It's like, and um, there were some people that were not happy. Not happy. I got shot at a few times. Um, they were not happy about me leaving. And I had to look over my shoulder a lot. I stayed in, uh, indoors um, for about a month and a half. Hmm. I stayed indoors. I didn't want to leave because, you know. And, um, yeah, eventually I knew the only, there's only one person that can that calm it down is the Don himself. I mean, uh, to Cyril, you know. And he calmed everybody down. And he's like, okay, cool. Leave him alone. He's my boy. You don't touch him. And that's it. And I got out of that. I I don't know how, but yeah. He, he, oh. Are you still mates with him, Cyril? Cyril was assassinated, bro. No way. Yeah, they assassinated him in uh, in 2009. Yeah, in uh, yeah, that case is still going. Yeah. Sad. So it was. Yeah, it was. He was. He was a good guy, you know. I mean, you if you you Google him, you'll see he was. I mean, it'll just if you Google his name, the first thing will come up: underworld boss. Um, yeah. Kingpin and all the thing, but I can tell you firsthand what what the kind of person he was, you know. And he was um, Cyril has never hurt anybody. It's like there's more mayhem if you leave gangs to just do whatever the fuck they want to do, mm. you know. If you got one powerful, you, you look at the, what happened to the crime after Cyril was gone. It was mayhem again. Mm. Every dude was trying his own, taking his own corner, you mm. know. So yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. every little corner, some dude was selling drugs and stuff like that. So, yeah, he was a, he was a great guy, um, absolute legend. Uh, Donovan met him because hmm. when they made when, when they made the movie about my life, I, I couldn't. There was a lot of stuff I couldn't say, and so he he had to sign it off to say that I'm okay with it. You know, Donovan hmm. was quite, quite, yeah. So we, so we met him. That's crazy. The larger than life dude, like he's like yeah. So, wow. Can imagine, right? Yeah. So, so talking about Donovan, actually, so you actually worked as a bodyguard uh, for one of the managers of Primi Piatti. That's right. And, and uh, you, you also started doing some training for them. And that was when you met Donovan. That's right. Yeah. He was fascinated uh, by your story, wasn't he? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and ended yeah. up writing a script about your life. And that's right. Uh, yeah. Maybe you want to tell us about that, uh, that story. Yeah. Um, uh, what happened was like, I was at home for, like I said, about a two months, month and a half. And then I got a call from Cyril again. And, it was like, and I saw the call and I was like, oh, no. In any case, I answered it. And he said, look, I need you to do one more thing for, the, for us. And I'm like, what? So he's like, come and see me at the office. I came to him and he told me, so I don't know if you guys can remember, there was a time in Cape Town where there was a lot of bombs going off, like mm -hmm. Planet Hollywood. and mm -hmm. God. Yes, and Wimpy. Yeah, and, yeah, I'm not going to say it's Pagat. I'm going to say it's the time of Pagat. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Wimpy and, and uh, in Camps Bay and lots of bombs going off. So they were bombing a lot of the restaurants. So there was a suspicion that because uh, the owner of Primi, um, he's, a, he's a big guy, uh, Nino Zanazi. Nobody knew what and why, why it was happening. So they said, hold on. We need to look after Nino to protect him. And they needed a, a personal protection for him. So Cyril said, listen, that's not, you know, you're going to be in the clubs just there. There's a look after him until we find out who these guys are. Because, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, yeah, I thought, okay, that's cool. So it's like a personal protection job, you know. And I looked after Nino. Oh, my God. You know, after the first month, I didn't know who was. He is abrasive. He's that Italian guy. He speaks like he's like a, he's a big guy, and uh, yeah, he drinks a bottle of J and B whiskey a day. So can you imagine? I have to look after this guy, bro. You can't pin him down, you know. And he's not. He's he just he's not scared of anything. So it was very exciting. It was very, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. We I, I had to go with him to his farm. You know, wherever weekends go with him, so that he's okay. And you know, where he is, I am. I had like a gun in my uh, my ankle and a gun in my back because we never know who's going to try bomb and whatever. And after three months, that was it. They found the the, the people. 
um, it was over. And so I said, okay, fine, I'm done at the end of the month. And then Nino said like, listen, you've been with me for three months now, you know, do you want to, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, no, stay with us. Uh, I'm like, uh, I said, okay, stay with us. You can work in Camps Bay. And I was, Camps Bay was a really cool place, you know, to work in. A, and I worked at the Premier Piatti there. I told him, but I don't want no like manager or whatever, just as a waiter. And I worked there as a waiter. And um, it was so much fun, bro, because no responsibility. You're making <laughs> cash-free bucks, you know, and it's a tax-free money. And it's just like, and you're in the toilet every half an hour. Because everybody, <laughs> you know, it's going to be like, uh, it, it, was, it was the best time ever. You know? and then, uh, uh, yeah, because it's, come on, Cam's Bay, bro. And, and then... Um, it was just such an easy, good, easy life, you know. But then, of course, because I don't know what it is. I am just good in this industry. I am a good communicator. I'm obviously pragmatic when it comes to numbers and stuff like that. And I know the systems, you know. So what they said was like, look, you dude, you're wasting your time. We need managers. We need people to sort of, you know. And, of course, I had the ability to delegate. So they sent me to the Waterfront store and I started uh, managing over there. And the Waterfront was the flagship, which is massive. So then what happened is Premier P actually started to franchise and they wanted to expand to go to Johannesburg. So now they need somebody to, to go and um, to Johannesburg to open the first store. And so obviously they called me. They obviously knew I, had, I love taking chances. A lot of the guys that worked there were like married and, you know, so I'd like to think it was because I was the best. Let's not say. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also the good thing was that there's two new franchisees came down and I trained them. So I did the training. I to, they stayed in the Cape Proteo Hotel and every day I was with them, trained them about the systems and, you know, just keep the integrity mm -hmm. of, the, of the business and, and systems and protocols. And so when they had to leave to, for Joburg, so after, after the three, four months training is over, they went to, to Premier PRT and said, listen, can't we have Bernard to go with us? And they were like, will that make you happy? They said, yes. They said, and so uh, Premier PRT came to me and they said, look, Will you go with these guys, like babysit them kind of, you know, but mm. you work for the franchise company. You don't work for them. I'm like, ah, oh, Joburg, dude, no. You know, because you hear all these things about Joburg. It's like <laughs> shit. And I'm like, no. They said, come on, please do this because that will make them happy and they're happy, the franchise, can everybody. So I'm like, okay. And I kind of like the two of them, Zander van Niekerk and, <laughs> and uh, Nicky van der Waal. Oh, you know, Nick, you know, Nicky van der Waal is the guy married to Leanne Diebenberg. Yeah. Uh -huh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, interesting. we became very good friends then. So I decided, okay, I said six months, that's it. I'll take six months. They said, nope, cool, that's all we need, you know, just set them up. Let them Bro, I got to Joburg as the best move ever. <laughs> Bro, Joburg are so different, man. <laughs> they are like big city life. So they would go, you would go to a bar and somebody would just come up to you in the bar. I say, yo, what's up, buddy? And I'd be like, whoa, what does this guy want? <laughs> and they'd give you their business card and say, like, do you want to come for a bri? Give us a call. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Seriously, something That's that true, yeah. never happens in <laughs> Cape Town. And I'm like, no. So yeah, I made so many friends. After six months, I went to me, I went to Premier Piazza and said, listen, uh, can I do another six months, please? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, <laughs> we'd be happy. So I love Joe Book. I mean, that was amazing. Like, I made more friends in the three years that I was there in the first 30 years in Cape Town. Seriously, it was. Mm. People, they almost kind of forced, forced to network. So there was networking, yeah. you know, and, and uh, you almost never go come back home with the people you go out with because you meet new people. <laughs> what, was that, what was that place that time? News Cafe, remember? News yeah, Cafe. yeah. Ravonia. <laughs> yes. So you go to News Cafe and, and I was like, I really, really loved it. And then and I got involved with like a lot, lots of the TV stars, lots of uh, very famous people. And of course, I'm that quiet introvert. And, uh, <laughs> Chess <Premier> player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Poetry writer. <laughs> Poetry writer. <laughs> Don't tell me. <anybody. laughs> uh, became this famous, 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 super famous spot. For all, um, for all this, and right next to the uh, Rosebank Mall was YFM, 
and YFM is quite big yeah. in Joburg. So you had YFM, you had Pumi Piyati, and everybody, anybody. And then obviously all the way around that was all the uh, modeling agencies, Next Models, G3 mm. Models, all the model agencies. So this was the place to be in Joburg. Now you take the place to be, and then you put Nicky van der Valt there, which is this super handsome guy. Everybody knows him. And then you put me there with this big mouth and everybody. So it's like just... The, <laughs> The place was busy. It was rocking, but with all the right people, you know. <laughs> it's cool. And like every table was like Isidingo and Generations and all <laughs> these famous actors and TV stars. <laughs> so everybody knew me, you know. And I was going to all these parties. Uh, it was like, like with Miss South Africa, I became good friends with uh, like Leanne Liebenberg and uh, what's it Portuguese? What, what's the name again? Um, any case, Rebecca Carrera. We were really ah. good friends. And yeah, it was just a, just a fun time, you know. So I was lived, I was walking on clouds at that time, earning a good salary, mm. nice house. Then um, I remember Donovan and a guy called Justin Cohen approached the the, the franchise company, and they wanted to do a show called Invent Yourself. Um, Justin is a bit of a motivational speaker, and um, obviously Donovan's more from a directorial kind of, you know, and well, at least it seemed that way. So I. Uh, the the franchisee, they didn't like the fact that the franchise company chose Rosebank because it was getting in the way of, of operations, you know. So mm. I was always, so the franchise company would phone me and say, Bernie, please, just, you know, kind of because we know Nikki, them, uh, they respect you. And, you know, so I had to kind of keep the peace. I always had to go. It's like, Donovan, <clears throat> okay, will you guys just give us three minutes? We just need to shout some orders. And then I would have to go back to Nikki and say, Nikki, listen. We need these guys. They're giving us exposure. Like, so it was constantly like that. <laughs> so Donovan and them were like, wow, this guy, you really did well. And then I think at the end of the first couple of episodes that they shot, they, they, it was a Friday and they said, dude, we really, we want to sit down. We want to buy you a bottle of wine because, you know, you really helped us, you know, and, and we like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. So we sat down. It was a Friday. And uh, I said, they said, what can we, I buy you a school of pin charge. I'll never forget and we started drinking and then drinking and drinking. Now, obviously, as a colored, the more I drink, the looser my tongue gets, you know? <laughs> I'm, telling them, I'm telling them these stories and I'm telling them these mm -hmm. stories. And the more I'm telling them, the more fascinated they are. So they're asking like, what did you pass? And, and now you must know, I'm, by this time, I'm training people on back office systems. I'm showing everybody how to do it. I've got like 42 staff, you know? <laughs> and um, so they couldn't believe that with the minimal uh, amount of um, education that I have, that I was doing all this and they thought I was lying. And then somehow Cyril's name came up and they were reading the papers a lot about all these things happening in the city. And they were like, Oh shit, were you that guy? And then, you know, everything came together. And Don was like, Yes. And Don was like, Whoa. And he then came back to me. He said, Man, I want to write this story. I want to, I was like, Yeah, whatever, you know. And <laughs> he said, Do you would you mind? I was like, Yeah, no, no, no problem. But I always had aspirations of opening my own restaurant by then. So he made a deal with me, which was a, this was a great thing. He said, I will t when is your day off? It was a Wednesday. He said, I will take you anywhere you want to go, a restaurant of your choice. I'll pay for it if you just tell me your story. So, of course, I'm thinking, okay, I can take this white boy to wherever I want to go. <laughs> and on his account, I can go because for, for, a, for a restaurant here, that's the best thing you can do to go see how the other people are doing it. Yeah. You know, so it was, and I remember Parkhurst, they had a lot of restaurants in, so, yeah. you know, I used to go there. So I thought, okay, opportunity, opportunity, put them together. And yeah, and that's how Donovan was fascinated by the story. And I told him every Wednesday we went, he used to buy me dinner, he used to sit, he had his little dictaphone, and I, I spoke, and he was writing things down, spoke so, and I, I remember listening to your podcast. You said it took a month. It didn't take a month. It took about seven or eight months because we only did it every, you know, sporadic. Yeah, it was like, yeah. mm. So it took a really long time. So obviously by that time, I got to know him better. And I, he, was, he, was a really, he was a cool guy because he could not speak Africa like Cape Flats, <laughs> but he thought he could. He's like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah. But you know, you, you can see it when somebody's doing it. They really, and I didn't want to burst his bubble. And I heard him say <laughs> on your show that, yeah, I can actually, uh, no, Donovan, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm even Shout out to Donovan. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but he was honest and yeah. earnest about, I could see in his eyes that this guy doesn't want to use my story 
for to self sort of grandize his own position mm. and, and he, as his uh, directorial thing, he really wanted to tell the story. So that I felt was cool. And it opened me up as well, that and all the wine, but it opened me up to tell him <laughs> more. And sort of, I, I went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. He found it fascinating. Now, you know, everybody has got a story. Mine is no better than anybody else's. But, you know, so, but he saw how fascinating it was, you know, and the more I was talking about it, the more I realized, oh, shit, dude, I was lucky there. You're like, like, oh, shit, I did that. You know, then you started realizing, but I left it. I was very blase about it because it made him happy. And I could see that he was doing this honestly. So I just left it with him. I let it uh, marinate with him. Mm. I then left to, I got solicited, uh, headhunted to do a thing in, in uh, Emirates and uh, to go open a, a restaurant there, like a five-star thing in Bahrain. Uh, I went there, I took a team over and stuff. And I, you know, I totally forgot about the whole thing. And then Donovan sent me an email. I'm going to put forward your script as a, I'm like, yeah, I know it was a short email. Yeah, whatever, boom. And um, and then he sent me a message like, a, I don't know, about a month later, we won. And I was like, what? He said, yes, so the, the script, um, I, I might get this wrong, but I know the DTI and blah, 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 they have annually, they had this uh, script competition and you put forward your script and then they choose one. And that one, then obviously people will throw in money to that one becomes a movie. So yeah, so I script one. But now it comes the tricky part because I now need to read the script mm -hmm. and I need to okay the whole thing. So it's 260 something pages, bro. Whoa. And this is a guy <laughs> that has never read a book in his life. I've never <laughs> read a book from cover to cover. I'm like, so he's like, Bernie, you need to read this because you need to read it from cover to cover and, you know, cross out what and, you know, how does it read? And because mm -hmm. we had, then this was like the first draft. So here's something weird. The very first book I ever read <laughs> in my entire life was the book of my own life. That was <laughs> wow. crazy. So, yeah. And it was, wow. it was captivating. You know, you go to it like, I wonder if he's going to make it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so that was the very first. And then I kind of, then I think I got into it because I didn't really, I didn't realize the magnitude of that. I was like, this is actually really going to happen, you know? But again, it wasn't my thing. It was Donovan's thing. And I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. But Donovan was such, he had, he was such a good person. He, he involved me and he kept me in the loop with everything. You know, he wanted me to be there for authenticity. He wanted me to assist him on the, on the uh, actual the days of, of shooting. Um, any uh, 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 fixes that they made onto the script, I was there to, um, to okay. Or not. And, and this, this I, I respected him for that, you know. Um, yeah, I also cut my teeth in that because I, I, a lot of things didn't go the way I expected it to go. But of course, it was my first and it was Don's thing. But it was an amazing experience. I, it, it, it was, there was good and bad. It was an amazing experience, as you can imagine, to have a, a bi autobiographical thing like that. Mm. And there's a few reasons. Number one, the, it was an, the, the, the actual feature film was well, it was very, very well done. Don is an amazing uh, director. Mm. And um, secondly, uh, the bad part is that it sort of it, it brought up a lot of old stuff from my past, mm. you know? Uh, I needed to okay it with Cyril to ask because there was a few things in there, can we count? So we tried right. to stay as broad as possible, but obviously as close to the story as possible. So obviously there was a little bit of creative license and stuff. So we didn't, you know, we couldn't say too much, but we still, I still wanted, I didn't want to imagine you release a movie and there's a guy yeah, called, so, yeah, that was, that would not be cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So he okayed it. And I thought anybody below that, I don't care about them, you know, they, but if he, if he says it's okay. So he yeah. gave me the right, he gave me the blessing and he gave Don, he really liked Don as well. And he said, okay, you know, go for it, do it. And, it was, it's a surreal experience for the first time when you see the, the filming and that, okay, because you don't really see the end product. But the first time you see that and you see your mother, you see an actress playing your mother mm -hmm. after you chose the actress. I used to sit there when wow. we did the castings. I used to sit with Donovan. Obviously, mm -hmm. Donovan had the, the final say, 
but he would ask me, what do you think? Oh, yes, and Donovan is he's so into his, his art, bro. Um, he went and smoked buttons. You can cut this out if you want. <laughs> he, went, he went to like, I need to know everything about this. So we went into Hanover Park, and he sat, he went right into the ghetto, into the gangsters' rooms, and you to, yeah, just to, you know, to mm. know the authentic. To be so authentic, authentic yeah. and get the authentic vibes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. so when, when, when we filmed it, he knew exactly the responses and how they fall, and, you know, as opposed to just me telling him. <laughs> so, yeah, so Don, Don was right up in there. And was, I'm amazing. very proud of, of the movie. I'm happy for it. Um, I didn't make much money out of it. I, yeah, yeah, but that's not the point. The point for me was when I go to Hanover Park now, the respect that these kids have, you know, they're like, wow, mm -hmm. man. I don't know how many kids it helped, mm -hmm. but I can tell you at least in a, every year, I get about three or four random messages on Facebook um, of, of guys telling me, are you Bernie Barty's? Thanks. <laughs> okay. With the accent. They're like, thank you for that. And, and you know, I bet you there's a few kids out there that use that as a sort of springboard for them. And um, that for me is for an amazing. Sure. It'll be thing. somewhere yeah. out there. Yeah. yeah. You know, what's so cool about that story, Bernie is as well is like, you know, how often people sit around and drink wine and they say, yo, we're, we're going to do this and that and that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and actually, you know, to actually have it happen is actually yeah. such an amazing thing, you know? So, so actually you had quite a few weird and, and disturbing incidences after the movie, as you mentioned, yeah. you ended up yeah. moving to Thailand uh, yeah. and starting a business there. But ultimately, yeah. um, while you were there, you actually would sit and speak to some of the S South African expats and then yeah. they were often knocking the country and yeah. you end up defending it. And, yeah. and yeah. eventually you were like, you know, I actually, I'm going to head back to, to South Africa after 11 years uh, yeah. living in Thailand. Um, yeah. and, uh, when you got back, you kind of wanted to start a business. So you pitched a, yeah. a, an idea to, to start a sort of a colored centric TV yeah. show yeah. and called colored TV. Hello, um, Hello you tell us yeah. a little bit about that show and, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, how it went from there. I, I think this has a lot to do because that bug bit me, uh, when Donovan sort of, um, uh, I, I was with him through the whole process of making the movie and I was like, wow, man, this is cool. Not because it was my movie and the story of my life. I'm kind of, you know, as ex extroverted as I am, I'm a very private person. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Mm. So I was like, I love the whole industry. You know, it was, it was amazing. And I was involved in it. I left it there. I left it at that. But I've always thought to myself, eh, if I if could ever do something like that, I would do. But what I did was, I'm a business card kind of guy. So I would take everybody's business cards, you know, keep in touch, keep in touch. That's the Joe Big thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and when I got back, because I left uh, Thailand, it's like that. It was a split decision. It was a Wednesday. I had another fight with some South African ex expats over there. And I remember this one woman said to me once, she said, if you feel so strongly about South Africa, what are you doing over here? And I was like, <laughs> you know what? You're right. So I need to go back. You know? and, and I think the Monday, that was it. I was out of there. I left. I was on the plane and I was thinking to myself, what the hell am I going to do? Because you know, when you go from South Africa to Thailand, your, your, your money is times four and a half. When you come back the way, mm -hmm. it's minus four and a half. So you, you're going to have problems. And uh, I got back. I was like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Lucky this friend of mine said, um, come stay with me for a while until you, you know, tell, until you know what. And I went and I stayed with him. I remember he didn't have um, Mnet or DSTV, whatever it is. He just had the SABC channels. And uh, he, he went to work every day and I was stuck in his apartment. I sat there every day watching. Uh, of course, that's the best thing. Can you imagine being away from for like four or five years? SABC is like the best thing ever because, you you know, <laughs> you're like, wow. TV. <laughs> yeah, you're hearing the accents and you're hearing people speaking Zulu and Koza and all of this again. It's like, you're like, I'm super to be back. Like, but one thing I realized that, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's something I'm missing here. And I realized that there is no um, colored. Like, so I just want to hear that. And I'm in Joburg, not even Cape Town. So I was looking forward to hearing a little bit of Yara Usit Me Bru and that kind of, you know, because that's how I grew up. So I got back to the country and this was the longest period I've been out to the country. So also I was like, I was yearning for that. Then I realized that, hold on, there's no representation at all for colored people. There was, you know, 
then I googled and I, and I, I thought to myself, I, I googled like w c colored shows and there was nothing, zero. I then stumbled on a, a guy called um, Charles Ash. He had a, a website called braino.com. And uh, I contacted him and I said, Charles, um, can I meet with you? Charles then sent me a message back. Oh, are you Bernie Bikes? I've been looking for you for five years. We want to do an article on, uh, on you on our site, you know, about brown people, colored people doing mm -hmm. good and blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, no worries. Um, I, I, he said I can meet him like a week later in Melville. Because uh, I wanted to ask him, listen, what can we do about this? So uh, what I did was I started to write. I thought to myself, let me just give this a shot. I, st I started to write something uh, like a, a skit show. Like basically if you took Saturday Night Live and in living color and you mixed it, nice. that's what, you know, what it's about. But for colored people. <laughs> so you take the word in living color and you in living colored you know, <laughs> so we got that and then we did like, so I, I wrote that just out of nowhere. I don't know where it came from. Uh, you know, I started writing it, writing it and did, and like, it was just a what if. So I went to see this Charles guy and I was like, Charles, little did I know that Charles was actually busy. That was his life's work. He wanted to fix um, uh, media exposure for colored people. <laughs> and then I thought, let's do this. So I got on board with him and he said, let's, let's fight SABC. So we took on SABC. So we went to them and he's a, he's a very smart guy, very academically, very like, uh, so he did a lot of research, a lot of research. And we found out that the, the breakdown, obviously in, in a Bill of Rights, it should be that because we were 12% of the country. So you can't have 0% media exposure for colored people if we are 12%. Mm. Then one of, one of the things that, that really helped us in our case, we had a case against them, is that they had a show called Lotus FM for Indian people. So how do you justify having for that specific demographic, Indian music and stuff, Lotus FM, if you cannot have a radio station for colored people going, you know, so uh, it went back and forth and back and forth. And we went to SABC, SABC, but the more we went to them and told them, listen, we've taken this to constitutional court, you know, they said, okay, we see what you're trying to say and you kind of right, but bring us content. If we like your content, we'll give you a slot. So we also had their backs against the wall kind of because they knew that we were right and we would have won that case if we, get, if we went to constitutional court because there was nothing. Uh, we, I, I got no problem with there being 70% Zulu and Koza and Pedi and uh, I got no problem with that because that's the demographic. Yeah. But where is our 12%? Where is that depicting Hanover Park, depicting Easterus, uh, all those areas, you know, and, sh you know, having shows about that. So eventually I finished this little script I wrote and uh, I went to Donovan. I was nervous. I was like, I said, Don, what do you think? Don read it and he came back to me and says, Bernie, you actually on some, onto something here. So hmm. I've already tapped into my resources, you know, he said, I mean, you actually onto something. I went to SABC, cut a long story short. They came and they said, great, you got it. We'll give hmm. you a slot. We like, we like this. But are you sure you're not going to um, stir the pot a little bit too much? Are you sure the colored people said so they were worried that we're going to push off the colored people because a lot of this was the no front teeth thing. Mm -hmm. Hello, yeah. my name is Hamad and stuff like that. We're like, no, come on. That's who we are, you know? And, um, so we thought now that we have them by the balls, we're going to squeeze a little bit harder. So we asked them to take off like, uh, new, like Nuit for Nuit. They gave us their highest slot. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so we got Nuit for Nuit. Yeah. And they said, okay, they'll give, they'll give us 23 episodes. Obviously, we got the money and everything. And uh, we did the show. It was great. It, was, look, it wasn't as refined as I wanted it to be. And also, it, uh, they moved so far away from what I wrote because they brought in their own writers and you can't mm. do this mm. because that's going to offend this person. And so it was, what you saw on TV was a lot softer than, you know, I, th I think mine would have been a lot funnier, but they were, that, mm -hmm. I don't know if they wanted to be politically correct. It was so funny, man. It was like, a, you, we, we were, we spoofed everything, you know, we spoofed the, <laughs> the Kardashians, we spoofed everything, everything like the new, reading the news. There was a guy with no front teeth and we're like, yeah, today. And then on the street, you know, <laughs> And like we had the man on the street, like, you know, when you uh, interviews, you, yeah. the man on the street was like a real man on the street, like a, a hobo. 
and then he would interview <laughs> people, you know, and then ask them for like food afterwards and stuff like that. So it was it just, it was amazing. It was funny. And there I did it. Five years later, I come back to the country in the space of eight, six months. I got my own TV show on, a, on a SABC's best slot, seven o'clock on a SABC two, you uh-huh. know, I got this out there, but then again, boom, smack in the face, my own people, colored people. I get threats on my email and how dare you depict us in this way. I was like, are you kidding me? Wow. They were offended because I depicted our people and doing things that we do, hmm. giving and handi- handing each other a key for when you're 21 saying may brew. I mean, you know, colored people have the best swear words, you know, Donald, Donald Trump <laughs> says, I've got the best words. No, we have the best <laughs> swear words. Your master, this, and you know, so, why not celebrate it? You know, why not celebrate who we are? We are not homogenous in any way, but I mean, come on, you know, um, yeah. I'm not saying you must choose a side. I'm not saying choose white or choose black or that. I, I believe that it works like my, my primary identity is that I'm human, you know? Mm-hmm. And then second, secondly, I am a uh, male. Then only am I South African. And then if you want to identify a broader identity of me, I'm colored. Because that mm-hmm. is w- what I identify with, you know. In fact, I feel sorry for, as anyone of you that said about the, being a white, I thought about it, being a white yeah. English, English South African. Speaking. That is bad because you must, you, you, I, I mean, it's so, because if you take an Afrikaner in, in Cape Town and an Afrikaner in Pretoria, they share the same biscuits, burwars and biltong thing. <laughs> but you guys, your identity, uh, sorry, I don't mean you guys, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I feel, I really, yeah, yeah. I feel sorry for South Africans like, like, like the soap pillar, what they call him? Soap yeah. pillar. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I do feel sorry for them, but they're my brothers, you know? Yeah. They're my brothers. We sing the anthem together. We go watch rugby together and stuff. So, but the coloreds, man, I, and I, I say that I'm a colored bro, but they're the most racist. Um, I, I, they, I've, I've never heard the K word used so much than I do in Hanover Park and in those areas. Yeah. Seriously. We are the most racist of all the demographics. I will say that to you, and I, 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 I'm sorry if, if the, but that, that is, yeah. And I don't know why we can blame it on the system, say that we are now being oppressed by blacks or whatever they want to say, but we need to shake that off. We need to get the hell out of that and sort of, you know, then they were racist amongst each other. So first we racist other people because you were white, we hate you, and now you're oppressing me, you're black, I hate you. Then they hate each other. So you get the what I call the super coloreds. So you have the super coloreds from fairways and the, you know, so they like, how dare you say our way or we mm. or you know? No, it's a it's a it's a it's a part of us we want to forget. It's that's the way the oppressor wanted us to speak and stuff like that. No, you damn wow. idiot. That is how we, that is what we are. We're proud of it. I'm proud of it, at least, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't want to adapt uh, Gareth Martin and Craig Haywood's accent, you know. But there mm-hmm. are nuances yeah. in their accent that makes us South African, you know. Yeah. Joburg is so much, ad- so advanced in this sense that if you go to Joburg, I had an apartment in Bramfontein. It was very close to Wits University. And mm-hmm. in the building I lived in, there was a lot of students. And I'm so happy when I'm there because I see the future of South Africa. I can close my door and hear the guys down the, the alleyway and I can't define anymore if, if it's a black or white guy. Mm-hmm. Even, even the Vert Oaks are saying, Ish, eight, when they, you know? <laughs> so I'm sure if they speak to their mother and their father, it's different. That makes me happy. That doesn't happen with colored people, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. Again, I can't say what it is. I'm very disappointed in that, in a lot of my people. This, that disappoints me about us, but... I'm going to change me. I've changed. I'm going to change me. I, uh, I, I'm proud of who I am. In Thailand, you go to this island I lived on, Koh Phangan, and uh, the Thais, the locals will say, Awe, you know, because that's <laughs> how I, I agree. I'm comfortable saying that. I don't go like, hi, guys. How are you doing? How are you doing today? No. And like, Awe Owens, and you know, but it's funny when you hear them say so. That's so, funny, yeah. man. And, and, and so maybe you can just like explain what what colored actually means what the term means you know what you people are like it's because because for for we've tried to explain it i guess for a, a few times to other guests and that on the show yeah, yeah, yeah. probably failed quite miserably so yeah. <laughs> probably got okay a way. um i'll tell you right now um okay 
colored is being colored is i can tell you firstly what it's not it's not a color this is where we get it wrong this is where where all those that are angry and hateful this is where they get it wrong because the minute you say you're colored they think it's being said in a derogatory way and they think you're referring to a color being colored is not me referring to my color as mm. much as it's referring to a black guy as barack obama does not my being called black because it's not said in a derogatory way you know if you take if you take the stigma out of the word then you're only left with the word right so mm. people start they thinking about the stigma so much like um yeah this is the label they put on us and stuff like that but how do you want to be identified i mm. i i would like to all these guys that 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 say this, colored is a, it's a bad word and i i want to ask them how, how do you want to be identified do you want to be identified as as south africa a south african i of course like i said my, the third i said i'm Those human i'm male and first, yeah. yes but you need to be you know put, put in a in a broader subculture you know because we are not i was i was like i said i mean in all these countries that i that i lived in even within them there's subcultures it's only the asians that don't have as many as the western uh as as people in the, we mm. have a lot of subcultures for example america the novak indians and the cherokees those those are americans but yet these americans now you've got african americans you've got latino americans you know you so they proud of that why are colleds not proud to be saying that i'm a colled south african i do not understand it i mean we need to know that there are things we should be proud of for example i believe that we were the first to speak the afrikaans language the way we know it now because that was the only way the 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 they could communicate with people mm -hmm. right of course when the dutch came here we were they didn't find the causes in zulus here they found me and my forefathers running with spears on the beach you know <laughs> so those were the people that worked in their kitchens those were the people that worked on the farms and those were the mm -hmm. people that derived and came up with this language and how to speak to them and they used their dutch and they sort of cut off all the gins and the hins at the end and just you know that's why it was called combais uh, afrikaans that's where it started be proud of it stop you know like i'm proud of that i'm proud of the things we do so for me being colored is is doing all those things saying having the best swear words saying your master Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 man, I'm so super proud of it. Again, only now that I'm proud of it, I look at guys like you and I'm like, shit, man, I could have been you. You know, your identity yeah. right now, you're like, fuck it. Now, you know, where am I? You know, yeah, what's um, the identity? Yeah. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm super proud of being colored, and I, I just wish I could go out there and stand on this hill and tell people, be, be proud of. our heritage be proud of the way we fold some mosses we don't you know the guy across the road from me when his daughter is 21 he's going to slaughter a goat mm. do you do that as a colored no we do not do that do we judge the guy across the road for doing it no as long as he's not blowing the smoke into my house and killing the thing mm -hmm. where i can see it i've got no problem with that that's his culture so the minute yeah. you can respect that that's that guy's culture that guy is going to respect your culture but we shooting ourselves in the foot by going out there saying we have no culture we just going to let some colors want to be white some colors want to be black you know just like mm. i want to be khoisan you know i want to mm. that's that's where i relate to that's that's where i feel comfortable with but dude like i mean i was watching this clip about this um this guy that got run over by a car here in platterkloof at the at the uh, gasoline station but The, the car was just reversed and it, it slowly slowly ran over him but what was amazing was everybody jumped out of their cars white black bure to lift up this car so this boy could get out from under this car now this guy was a petrol attendant do you see where the color comes in there nowhere those guys ran out of this car because they were all south african they all felt that i got to help this guy you know hmm. so we need to take the color out of the conversation and say like what is it like you said what is it to be colored for me for it's it's got nothing to do with the color it's about being a specific a south african with a specific demographic that fits in a specific subculture and i'm happy about my demographic graphic 
I mean, mm. I, I, there's a sad part of our history. Yes, there is. But there's also a fun part of our history. The mm. carnivals, mm. the flower sellers. Mm. There's a fun part of our history. People don't embrace it anymore. It, and it's the super colored that are bringing us down. And I, not, not up, they're bringing us down to their level. We, they are, there's very, a big part of our colored community that's proud to be colored. We've got a very strong uh, Muslim uh, colored community, the Malay colored community. We mm. love it. We embrace it. I do not want to be black and not, uh, not black, sorry. I don't want to be uh, Zulu or Khoza. I don't fit yeah. in there. But what if I got married to a, a Khoza woman? Then I would probably adapt some of, of her traditions and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm proudly colored, bro. I mean, uh, you can nice. call me colored. If it's said in a derogatory way, of course. You I mean, you could. Like anything. Yeah, yeah. You can say. You should put it straight now. You know, we've got it straightened yeah. out because, you know, Gareth and I, like he said, he's try we've tried a few times. So thanks for, thanks for clearing that one up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and, but if you, if you think about it, there's actually so much history and heritage. Like, you know, the, the Khoi San people are yeah. almost like yeah. the original human yeah. sort of thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's the yeah. way. Uh, so, so yeah, there's so much to actually be proud of. Yeah, um, we can trace it. Exactly. We can trace it with with, with the with the with the the rock writings, with the bush, with the hieroglyph. We mm. can we can actually trace it, and 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 I can go to these guys and say, but can you? Is yeah. there anything written mm. in Durban? Is there any? Show me. Yeah. But I can take you here to a couple of my, and I, you know, so we can we can trace it that far back. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's actually a, there's actually a, um, a colored guy. His name is Falco. I'm not sure if you know of him. Yeah, he's yeah, a yeah. Graffiti no, artist. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I watched something of him on the yeah. Red Bull TV channel the other day, and I was like, I'd really dig to get him on. He seems like a really cool guy. Yeah, Falco. Yeah. I can get hold of him for you if you need. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Oh, Thanks, awesome, man. Awesome, man. Wow. Yeah. So, so, but just before, like, just kind of, I guess, one of our last questions here. You know, you, your your wife is Norwegian. And yes. um, you've taken her back to Hanover Park. And I think she was a little bit shocked with actually what yeah. went on there, like the yeah, conditions, yeah, yeah. And these sort of yeah. things, which basically led to you guys wanting to change something in, you know, and, yeah. and now you have, you know, this business and this charity yeah. and that, that you're running. So can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was exactly like you said, you know, we, we drove, uh, it wasn't the very day we landed, I think two or three days later, we rented a car. And I told her, okay, come, let me show you where I, I grew up. You know, she wanted to see it. And <laughs> I remember as we were driving, we were driving through it. And, and I'm talking to her, like, okay, and this, I mean, but I'm looking ahead. And then I look to my left and I just see snot and trana. She's like, <laughs> snot. And I'm like, Shame. what's going on? And she like, she's like, burst out. She couldn't believe that people could live like this now, also understanding that the unemployment in Norway is like minus five, you know, there's like, don't <laughs> have unemployment. And because it's, it's a, a sort of a socialist democrat, uh, democratic system, everybody earns a fairly good salary, you know? So you don't have this abject poverty. And mm. so now you come from that and you see people living in shacks and stuff like that. We, she was broken. And um, then we went in more into the, the community where I grew up. And I saw the old aunties and stuff like this. And I, I told them, hey, we, we can do something about this, you know. I mean, the little that we have, we can always, we, we uh, continue the little soup kitchen. There was an old soup kitchen there. So every week, we did a soup kitchen. We fed about 250 people. Hmm. And it's not much. We bought like 40, 50 loaves of bread. And, you know, we had people working with us. And then just, so you can't stop, of course. You know, you did one week and then next week and people start. So then from the soup kitchen, we saw this crash and the crash was in the old church that my dad had. And mm. it was winter when we got here, bro. There was not, they didn't have nothing on the floor. It was a cement floor. So mm. imagine 60 kids in these little rooms. And then we, we went, went to some friends who said, please, we got a friend that owns a carpet company and he put in carpets. And then we got, we got some um, heaters and yeah so just every week we bought more and more and we got books and stuff so they sit now i mean they so sit that we actually want to move on to another area to help another crash now because there's nothing more we can give them you know yeah. and we're so happy about that if you see the before and after pictures it's amazing so that's that's good that's on its way i do believe obviously that's where it starts help the kids you know kids first you know and then yeah. uh, the soup kitchen um, the soup kitchen in Hanover Park is we put that on pause now because we're moving to another area called Volverefir. So 
we then call this thing uh, the make a change project because i love michael jackson and make mm -hmm. that change so <laughs> yeah we call it the make a change project and yeah we get, we don't we occasionally get like somebody will give us a thousand yen, and 500 day and whatever and that's great you know it helps and yeah and then we just so we keep doing that she's a great person and i mean i'm very lucky like that she's beautiful um wow and then mm -hmm. i'm lucky like that and then also <laughs> what a good person she is you know because um um yeah so we're pregnant now so yeah she's, cool yeah Congrats. so Congratulations. We're gonna have, yeah we're gonna have the baby in norway um, so I will probably be there for a few months and yeah, but I mean, we love the charity, the charity, it, it, it's really, a, um, wow. It's just, it's a stimulate. It's so, it's a stimulating thing to do guys. It's really, it's like, I guess we'll go out, I'll, I'll have a couple of drinks with the boys every weekend and stuff, but really I will Sunday morning. I'll still wake up and I'll still, we do, we do a clothing drive next weekend. We're doing a clothing drive. We've got a whole bunch of clothing for winter now and we're going to so it's just to see the kids and yeah, like, it's really it's the most satisfying thing I've done in a long time. And also because I put myself there. It's very easy for me to do that because I look at these kids and I see Bernie there. And I know that somewhere in that, there's a Bernie, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I need to, you know, so in, in all those kids standing in the queues where they give soup, I just know it, that there's, I, there's, there's a me there somewhere. And mm -hmm. that guy just needs that out. He needs to know that, you know, so yeah. So that's that what keeps me going, you know. Now when I have my own kid, I'm looking forward to that as well. That's amazing. That's really, really amazing, man. Congrats, guys. It's a, you know what? I think there are very few things, as you mentioned, as gratifying. It's almost can be like a, yeah, there's a feel a real feel good thing to just give and help and, and see yeah. a smile on someone else. But even more exciting is like someone even already like how many you don't even know how many children that that have been there that are like already going to yeah. make that change or, yeah. or you know they're in them now already so like yeah. yeah it's really cool i really hope that um that you can sort of keep that up and and keep that I'll going try. but what, what what so i know you were planning you're going to go head over to norway soon but um yeah like uh you know people want to contact you or help you in any way with this this endeavor well how, how can they go about that i probably think the best the best to do is like um email me or because we don't really have a, a website yet and um, we were trying to, to put up where because it was just, we were doing it in the beginning as just a by the way kind of thing. And we were just funding ourselves, but it's sort of getting so big now that we, you know, any help will do. So we don't have the website yet. It's quite a long word. It's a, it's uh, Bernie at the make a change project.org. So yeah, I don't know mm -hmm. how, how we can get that out there, but yeah, obviously also on my Facebook page and stuff like that, just, um, I haven't formalized it. I don't think we've formalized it to that extent where we will have the website and stuff. But when we do that, yeah, I'm going to solicit and put it out there to as many people as I can for help. Of course. Um, obviously, right now, I'm still in a, a like, kind of job hunting because Rebecca leaves in, a, in three weeks' time. Um, she's going to go, obviously, for medical reasons. It's best, best for her to be in Norway. Um, and then I follow. I'll be there in November for the birth of our child. And... Um, mm -hmm. We want to live here. We want to live in South Africa. And people think it's weird and they like, especially South Africans when, when Rebecca tells them, no, oh, I want to live here. And they're like, I hate that about South Africans. We're so negative about our own country. They're like, why? So they're like, but they're, funny enough, here's the one thing. If you always ask South Africans, have you, the ones that always complain, you say, okay, so where else have you lived? Then nowhere. So like, okay, <laughs> you should do that. Go live somewhere else for a while and then you'll appreciate your country a little bit more. So yeah, so we want to live here. Not as a, like a, I have to be honest, the only thing that is a bit of a concern is the, the crime and the safety. Because now, I mean, I can look after myself. But, yeah. um, you know, you have a kid, you have a wife, you know, I can't be watching over Rebecca and our baby every day. And this is the, that is the reality of it. So, um, but yeah, ideally we want to, start a business there or I get a job over there and we live there and here. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's ideally what we want to do, but I do not want to leave South Africa because I believe with all the skills that I've acquired and all the things that I can do, I should put back to the, in, into the community. I yeah. should plow back and yeah, yeah it's, it's part of who I am.
Yeah, buddy. Yeah, but I totally agree, man. You just, uh, there's so much for you to share, you know, and be yeah. part of changing a, a whole era, which is yeah. super powerful, man. So, yeah. so, but just our, our last question is, um, you know, one of our favorites and I think it's one you'll like. So what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Uh, okay. To me, you know what, there was a guy, uh, uh what's his name on radio that used to say this when i was growing up and now it's almost become my credo i like to say question everything you know being ridiculously human i tell you why i think it's like one you should question everything question your religion question your situation you see the guy behind you there nelson mandela and the picture on the wall he questioned everything he said why is it like this right so question everything and to make you ridiculously human, you need to change what you can. So this is why I have done all the things. I question everything, but now I'm trying to change the things that I don't find is right. So I want, I think we should all change the little things. You don't need money for this. You need to just, you need to give back the dignity to the people on the street. Don't, you don't need to give a guy money. Greet him. Just greet the guy when you walk past him, a vagrant. Say, hey, hey, buddy, how's it? I do that every day when I walk my wife to work. These guys are now greeting back. I don't give them money, but I gave them their dignity back again, you know? Mm -hmm. So that for me is how I want to be and I want to stay a human like that. I want to question everything and I want to make a change where I can. I want to change the little things that I can. And if we all do a little bit of that, stop, put, put everything aside, put the money, put religion, all of that. Just let's all, you know, we've, we've, millions and thousands of years we've lived on this and we haven't killed each other off yet <laughs> so you know so we, we've we've gone through all of that without having to point uh, hold the bible or quran or anything in the hand just try and change what you can make little changes and question everything question question why just why 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 is it like this and i'm sure you'll be able to make a change that's what i i believe that's why i called my my project, the Make a Change project. So I want to make a change. And that's why I think I'm ridiculously human. <laughs> I love it. Bud, that's yeah. powerful. I love that, man. Well done, bud. That's a great, yeah. great one. <laughs> you guys so, are doing a good job there. I like, yeah. I like what you're doing. Thanks so thank much, you, man. But I just wanted to just say thank you, like uh, just on, on my behalf, basically, like just you're such a storyteller, but you, you have a real knack yeah. for it, man. Yeah. You, you speak super well and you have like this great energy and uh, just everything about you. Um, no, thanks. People will feed off and can feed off and I, I've fed off. Um, and everything you've gone through is like just been this amazing kind of learning lesson and evolution yeah. and created this epic person of who you are today. And you have seriously clear and good great outlook on life and when what this actually all means um and i just loved listening to everything you had to say and i think you have so much to share and and somebody like you coming from where you came and doing everything that you've done um has such a massive opportunity to make a huge change in the world and you have already you know with with your movies and with your tv series and now with your your charity um that i just like seriously encourage you to to seriously uh carry that forward you know because even though you say you've like you get four emails of people that uh tell you you've changed them there's probably a hundred that don't email you and that's yeah. what that's yeah. what we find is that there's so many people that watch and listen but don't necessarily comment so those are the people that you are also really speaking to as well that you'll yeah. never ever know so but just you're an amazing guy uh we'll support you in any way we can and put you in contact with the guys I thanks so much that. for Thank sharing you. your story and being yeah. so happy and honest and fun yeah. and raw it was just a really yeah. great conversation but thank you man thanks gareth Thank you very much. It's a very kind words. I appreciate that. Pleasure. Yeah, man. And, and Bernie, just briefly from my side, look, Gareth said it super well there. Just, you know, the skills you have learned are amazing. And it's, it's a real story of hope once again, of like, when we look yeah. at you, it's not only hope, it's also like, you know, I can do more in my life. Like what the yeah. hell? Like I've come from a place that was probably ahead of you in terms of socioeconomic status and all these things as a, as a youngster. 
and, yeah. and what am I doing? You know, like yeah. it kind of, you are talking about asking questions and, yeah. and it's, it's really good to, to look at yourself in these scenarios as well. And yeah. so thanks for, for prompting that thought process within me and I'm sure within others. And, uh, and obviously the, the, the real gem of it all is that you are actually like you both said, someone is seeing this, someone is absorbing this and, and it literally is going to change someone's life, which yeah. is, Amazing. So keep telling the story and, and keep keep that smile going. It's it's really infectious, and yeah. Uh, yeah, we just we can't wait to see what happens and have a have a really good uh, you know trip overseas and, and good luck yeah. with the little one. It's that's that is a big cha- game changer as well. I'm sure. Thanks, Craig Haywood. Yeah. Well, yeah, if it's a girl, if it's a girl, her name is Lulu. Lulu <laughs> Africa. Nice. nice. Okay. Oh, cool. I, and the boy, because I love Michael Jackson, his name's going to be Jackson. Cool, I'm, I'm thinking about Jackson Gareth Craig. I'm not sure. <laughs> awesome, oh, yeah. Bernard, Bernard. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Bernard, yeah. Uh-huh. Cool, thanks. Oh, it says file deleted. Ah, uh, liar. Uh, good one. Uh, <laughs> nice this one. is Craig Blippen. He would have died. But <laughs> nice, but. Okay, exactly. Because, boys, it was no, so man. nice chatting to you. And, yeah, yeah thanks, you, you, you're doing a good job. I mean, it's inspirational. Thanks, bro. Thanks, you're not man. just you're not putting old titties and stuff out there. You're doing something that's like no man. So Thank solid, you, but we appreciate your time, respect. man, and keep up the good work. And uh, we're gonna, we'll, like we said, we can definitely like put you in contact with uh, I appreciate Eric. Appreciate that. And, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll we spoke about that the other day, so that's cool, man. Yeah, epic, man. Respect. Bye, buddy. Have yeah, a great bye. day. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cat.